We are on Act 4. Wait, is that right? Yeah, Act 4. Uh, 1301 in the 11th. <clears throat> <clears throat> the king comes in and says there's matter in these sighs, these profound heaves. This is Act 4, Scene 1, page 1301. You must translate. Tis fit we understand them. Where is your son? She says, um, to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, leave. Let us talk. On mine own lord, what have I seen tonight? What, Gertrude? How does Hamlet? So she's trying to get across. She hasn't said much yet. She's trying to get across. I've seen a tremendous amount. And he says, what? How is he? Mad as the sea and wind when both contend which is the mightier. When we last saw Hamlet and Gertrude at the end of Act 4, excuse me, Act 3, Hamlet tells her, let the king think I am just out of my mind crazy. Okay? So she says to the king, he's mad as the sea and his wind. In his lawless fit, behind the heiress, hearing something stir, Whips out his rapier, cries, a rat, a rat, and in this brainish apprehension, kills the unseen good old man. Brainish apprehension. Your gloss tells you brainish headstrong, passionate, <clears throat> in apprehension, conception, imagination. Well, what does she mean by, if we take the gloss, headstrong, passionate? What does she mean by that? You can be headstrong and passionate and not be crazy. She means he has too much brain, right? Not meaning smart like Einstein. She means there's something wrong with his brain. His brain is bubbling, as it were. Oh, heavy deed. It had been so with us had we been there. Notice what she hasn't told him. What did Hamlet say? After he lifted the heiress and saw that it was Polonius, excuse me, just before he lifted the heiress, is it the king? He hoped it was the king. His liberty is full of threats to all, to you yourself, to us, to everyone. So he's a threat to you, Gertrude. He's a threat to me. That's what the us is. He's a threat to the entire city or kingdom, if you want. So. He asks, how will this deed be answered? That is, what will the response, the public response, be to the killing of Polonius? It will be laid to us. We'll be blamed for this. Why? Who usually gets blamed in a country when bad things happen? The person at the top. Or in a company, who usually gets blamed? In a, you know, in a sports team. If the team does badly, it's not the players that get fired. It's the coach or manager who gets fired and gets replaced. He's saying, we're going to be blamed. Why? That we should have kept his lease, so to speak, short, restrained, and out of haunt. We should have kept Hamlet locked up. This mad young man. But so much, what, so much was our love, we would not understand what was most fit. When it, every time Claudius speaks and he uses those plural pronouns, I, first person, I, we, our, he's talking about himself, right? He says, 
My love for him was so great, I didn't know the right course of action to take. Where is he? He went to bury, or to take care of the body, to draw apart the body he hath killed. Or whom his very madness, like some ore among a mineral bit, metal's base, shows itself pure. Meaning, Hamlet killed Polonius. He did so, he killed intentionally. He didn't kill Polonius intentionally. But then she says, and the very fact that he's taking care for the body shows that there's still good in him. That's the thing about, you know, some ore among a mineral of metals based. There's a, 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 an ore in him that is worthy, that is good, that is noble and such. He says, Gertrude, come on, we need to leave here. Before the sun rises on the mountains, Hamlet will be on board the ship headed for England. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in. The king gives them a command. Find Hamlet, tell him to come to me. Okay. Another room in the castle, scene two. We have Hamlet enter, and he says, safely stoned, that is. I put Polonius where he belongs. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in. What have you done, my lord, with the dead body? Compounded it with dust. Where two tis kin. Why? Genesis. Because from dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return, God says to Adam. Okay? That kind of implies he's buried it. But not really. Tell us where it is so we can take it to the chapel. Polonius is going to get, they're assuming, a Christian burial. He's going to get the rites and the prayers over the dead prayed for him. Don't believe it. Uh, believe what? That I can keep your counsel and not mine own. That I can keep your counsel. I can keep your advice. I can keep your words. I can keep your secrets and not my own. Besides, to be demanded of a sponge. You take me for a sponge, Gildenstern says. You think I'm a sponge? Remember when Hamlet, um, when Polonius first con confronts Hamlet? My lord, do you know me? He says, yes, you're a fishmonger. Okay. Why? Is he literally? No. Is he figuratively? Is he a pimp? Mm -hmm. Not really. Though he does kind of pimp out his daughter on Hamlet at the beginning of Act 3. Not for sex, but to get information. So how does Hamlet mean that Rosencrantz is a sponge? I, sir, that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities. So, you're around the king a lot. The king gives you these things, his countenance, that is, you're in his presence, his rewards, his authorities. You have authority to do things. You soak all those up. Hamlet is making a comment about those who want to gain favor with the king. Okay? But such officers do the king best service in the end. And he uses an image of an ape with an apple. How the ape puts an apple in its mouth, sticks it in its cheek, and goes about doing all this other stuff, and then saves the apple to eat it last. When he needs what you have gleaned, that is, when the king needs the information you've gotten from me, he'll squeeze you. And sponge, you shall be dry again. So what's the imagery he's using? How do you make a sponge dry? You wring it. Earlier, previous act, end of the scene, Hamlet was speaking with his mother. And she's sitting here doing this. And he says, stop wringing your hands. I'm going to wring your heart. Why? He's got to get at what's inside her and get the rot out so that she can be saved, so to speak. Not spiritually, but so that she can see inwardly and see her faults and sins and such. Hamlet is using the same ringing imagery or metaphor. What's the king going to do with them? He's going to wring them dry and then what? Throw them away. 
I don't understand you. I'm good. I'm glad. Where's the body? The body's with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is the thing. What's he talking about? This is a political theory of the king's two bodies. One is physical. Two is the state or country. The king has a physical body. Okay? The king also has a political body, the body politic, so to speak. <laughs> we saw in, in Oedipus, after Oedipus accuses Creon of conspiring against him, Creon says, at some point, you know, you'd be a great king of an island with one person. And Oedipus says, the city is the king's. Well, by Shakespeare's day, it wasn't the city is the king's. The idea was the city is the king. England is Elizabeth. Or, use the language of the play, Claudius is Denmark. Hamlet Sr. was Denmark. Fortinbras Sr. was Norway while he was alive, okay? And Fortinbras Jr. will become Norway. So, king's two bodies, physical and political. The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The first one, the body is with the king, physical body. Second one, Hamlet is suggesting the king is not with the body, now, you've got a footnote, which we'll talk about in a moment. But that might mean the king is not with Denmark. The king has separated himself from that. But your gloss also suggests the body lies in death with the king, my father. That is, Polonius's body is dead, just like Hamlet's father is dead. But my father, Hamlet's father, the ghost, walks disembodied. That is, the king is not with the body. That's one possible meaning, according to the gloss. Or the other one is, Claudius has the bodily possession of kingship, but kingliness or justice of inheritance is not with him. Eh, that's a little, little more abstruse, a little more difficult to argue. Okay. So, scene three. The king and a few others come in. The king says, how dangerous is it that this man goes loose? You, yet must we not put the strong law on him? That is, we can't have our agents go and arrest him publicly. We can't have a big, you know, um, CNN type to do about him. Why? He's loved of the distracted multitude. This is, you know, you can, we can talk all kinds of politics over here. He's saying Hamlet's like a populist, a populist governor, a populist, you know, presidential candidate or whatever, the kind of person who appeals to a wide mass of people. Hamlet has the love of the people who like not in their judgment but their eyes. Claudius is saying the people are stupid. They like Hamlet because of his physical appearance. He's handsome, good looking. They don't like Hamlet with their judgment. They don't like Hamlet with their minds, all right? And where it is so, that is, and in situations where you have this, where the people like something because of how it appears, the offender scourges way, but never the offense. That is, they never take into account what it is the person has done to merit the scourge. That is, the justice meted out to that person. So he's essentially saying, we've got to walk very carefully here. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in. We don't know where the body is. Where is he? He's outside. He's under guard. Don't worry. Bring him in. So they bring Hamlet in. Hamlet, where's Polonius? At supper. 
supper, where? Not where he eats, but where I is eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are even at him. <clears throat> I have a vague, have I done this before in here? We haven't talked about this passage before, right? Okay, I'm getting you confused with my other two classes. Certain convocation of politic worms, okay? Couple of important terms there. Convocation. NTSU started, I don't remember, about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Started every fall, uh, Sunday before the beginning of fall semester, having what's called fall convocation. It's where everybody gathers together. It's a meeting, okay? Comes from the Latin vocare, which means to call, and con, or co, together, with. So all the faculty, all the students get together, the faculty wear their gowns, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. So he says he's at a certain convocation of politic worms. What's politic mean? I don't know what your gloss says. 21. Crafty. Could be. Politic or politics literally refers to power relations among people. Politics is all about shared power, how the people in a community share the power, so to speak. You know, democracy, you do that by electing representatives and all that kind of stuff. Then he goes on and says, um, a certain convocation of politic worms are even at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots, etc., etc. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. In 1521, you had what's called the Diet of Worms. The German is spelled W-U-R-M-S. Remember when I talked about Martin Luther? How on October 31st, 1517, he nailed 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg because he wanted to have a debate about these problems that he saw in the church. Well, he never got that debate. In 1521, the Holy Roman Emperor called for a meeting. It was called the Diet of Worms. Okay? In that meeting, Luther was told he was going to get to have his debate. He was told, show up, this location, and we'll talk. I think an archbishop or something like Cardinal was supposed to be there. Luther was granted what's called safe passage, that is, he would safely arrive there and be allowed to leave and return home safely. Nobody would stop him, mug him, kill him, etc. He agrees. He's thinking, finally, we get to debate these issues. Because from 1517 to then, he's been writing profusely writing all kinds of arguments for you know, various problems with the Catholic Church and such. He gets there, and the morning of the Diet, he's shown into the meeting room, and there's a table, and on that table is everything he has written over the last four years. Okay? And this is the premise of the debate. See, every real debate begins with a premise. Be it resolved, whatever, okay? This is the be it resolved. Take it all back. That was it. So he was thinking he was going to get to be able to debate the pros and cons of his 95 points. Take it all back. Luther says, give me 24 hours. I need to pray about this. Takes 24 hours, comes back the next day. According to his most authoritative biographer, Luther said, unless it can be proven to me by reason, my conscience, or scripture that I'm wrong, here I stand, I can do no other. That is, I stand with everything I've written over the last four years. Okay? Why is this important? Well, because Shakespeare is, a, every, every scholar agrees, Shakespeare is alluding in this passage to this event. 
The convocation of politic worms is an allusion to the diet of worms. Diet has two meanings. It can mean a meeting, or it can mean the food you eat on a normal everyday schedule, your diet, okay? Which meaning it is depends upon its pronunciation. So, Hamlet explains what he means when he says Polonius is at supper. Not where he eats. He's not eating supper, but he's being eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are even at him. That is, the worms are eating him now. Your worm is your only emperor for diet or diet. What is that? What in the world does that mean? The worm calls the meeting. We fat all creatures, else to fat us. True or false? If we're meat eaters, you don't eat some scrawny little cow or scrawny chicken. You fatten them up. You get a lot of good meat on them. So we fatten all creatures to fat us. And we fat ourselves for what? To live a good life? To earn a lot of money? To have a beautiful wife, family, home, whatever? No. We fat ourselves for maggots. Maybe. Pardon? Maybe we fat ourselves for maggots. Where have we heard maggots before? When Hamlet talks to Polonius and asks him if he has a daughter, and he talks about the sun being good kissing carrion, and how the sun breeds maggots in a carcass. Now he says, we fatten ourselves for what purpose? What is Hamlet saying is the purpose of our lives? To be food for maggots. Not a very positive outlook on life. The question is, is he acting or is he serious? Is this part of his feigning madness? Or is this what he really thinks? First time we really hear Hamlet, the first time we really get taken inside Hamlet's mind. And I was telling my Shakespeare course, bear in mind in a soliloquy what is happening. What is happening? The audience is getting a peek inside that character's mind. A soliloquy is spoken simply because the fiction of the theater requires the actor to verbalize those lines so that we can hear them. If there were some way for the actor to just think them and we receive those thoughts, that is what would happen. All right? That's why a soliloquy, soliloquy, true soliloquy, can't be heard by anybody else on the stage. Or, rephrase that, why nobody else can be on the stage. They can't hear those thoughts, but everybody else does. So, we fat ourselves for maggots. In that first soliloquy, sorry, I lost my point. In that first soliloquy, what's Hamlet talking about? Suicide at the beginning. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. And then we hear him talk at other points about death. So, your fat king and your lean beggar is but variable service. Variable service just means what comes immediately after it. Two dishes. Variable service. It could be two dishes, like big Thanksgiving dinner here or McDonald's. They both serve the same purpose, right? You get some nutrition from both of those. Or it can also refer to the kind of stuff those meals are served on. Fine china and silver, etc., and styrofoam. What's his point? They are to one table. That is, the lean beggar and the fat emperor both live to serve one table. The table for the worms here. Who's the emperor that he's alluding to? 
He's a king. He's not literally an emperor. What is an emperor? The person in charge of an empire. What's the king? The person in charge of a kingdom. They are equals in that sense. Okay? The king says, alas, alas. Why? Because Hamlet just said the king is fit to be food for worm. In the king's thinking, he's totally crazy. He's totally lost it. That's not going to happen to me. Hamlet goes on. A man may fish with the worm that hath eat of a king and eat of the fish that hath fed of that worm. Right? Makes perfect sense. King dies, he gets buried. A worm crawls through the king's body, eating it. The worm is captured by a fisherman, put on a hook, used as bait. A fish takes the bait, eats the worm, and is caught by the fisherman. The fisherman kills the fish and eats the fish and has just done what? Eaten the emperor or king. What dost thou mean by this? What does Hamlet mean by that? It should be pretty clear. So Hamlet makes it crystal clear. Nothing but to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar. A progress, you've got a gloss down there. Royal journey of state. Probably not clear as it ought to be. In Shakespeare's day and earlier in the Middle Ages, monarchs would somewhat regularly do what's called take a progress or go on a progress. And they would go throughout the kingdom. So a king would start in London and would head west and hit the major towns and then come down on the eastern part of the kingdom. Why they would do that is so that people could see them, so that they could hear judicial issues, trials and such. On those instances where the king did that, you could apply to have your concern heard by the king and the king would dispense justice. Okay? So that's what it means to go a progress. Hamlet has just said, however, that the king may go a progress, what? Through the guts of a beggar. Starting here and ending as a piece of shit. Sorry to be frank, but that's what he's saying. Notice the king's response. He doesn't ask, what do you mean? Where's Polonius? He understood crystal clear what Hamlet just called him. In heaven, charitable on Hamlet's part, Send thither to see. Send someone to heaven to see if Polonius is there. If your messenger find him not there, seek him in the other place yourself. Go to hell. But if you don't find him, go up the stairs by the lobby. You'll nose him there. Meaning, you'll know where he is by the smell. Okay? So, King tells Hamlet, we got to get you out. The ship, the bark is ready. You're to going to England. Hamlet, for England! Yay! That's why you have the exclamation. He's like, oh goody, road trip. King, Hamlet says good. So is it if thou knewst our purpose. Hamlet, I see a cherub that sees them. Cherub is an angelic being of knowledge. Hamlet saying, I know what the purpose is. <laughs> Farewell, dear mother. Is Gertrude in this scene? No, she's not. That's why Claudia says, thy loving father, Hamlet. He's like, it's me. Not, there's no woman here. My mother. Father and mother is man and wife. Man and wife is one flesh, and so my mother. Come for England. Why? Why does Hamlet say that? From a Christian theological perspective, true, kind of, they're one flesh, but it's not, the one flesh is not mother, and the one flesh is not father. It is a neutral sexed thing. But what is he doing? He's just playing with them. You know, we're going to have the 
Um, we had the play within the play, and it's called what? The Mousetrap? What kind of critter catches mice? Cats. If you ever watch a cat with a mouse, they're the cruelest, most sadistic little buggers there are. Because they'll let that mouse get away and then pounce. Let it get it pounce again. They do that. They just terrorize it until it often dies of a burst heart. So Hamlet leaves. The king says, follow him closely. And then the king tells us in his soliloquy what's going to happen to Hamlet. Hamlet's already alluded to knowing this. We don't know how, other than I see a cherub that sees them. He's, it's like he has a gut feeling, just like when the king, uh, when the dead king told him, the serpent that killed me now wears my crown. Hamlet said, oh, my prophetic soul. Like, I knew something was wrong with this. So, scene four. Hamlet is now on his way to England. He's not on ship yet. They gotta march across the plain, get to the port, so he can board ship. And we see young Fortinbras of Norway. Now, Fortinbras is the nephew of the current king of Norway. In other words, he's in much the same position as Hamlet, with this one huge difference. The present king of Norway did not kill his brother to become king. Okay? His brother was killed the original Norway was killed by Hamlet Sr. in battle. So, we see Fortinbras come in, talks to his captain. Fortinbras leaves, captain's there. Hamlet comes in. Hamlet asks him, whose troops are these? Uh, Norway. How purposed? Again, Poland. Why do you think Hamlet stops and asks these questions? This is a foreign army on his territory. He's the prince, future king. He's got some interest in what's going on here. Okay. So he asks, why are they going to war against Poland? Who commands them? He tells them. Going against all of Poland or just some part? The frontier. Then the captain says, you know, to be honest with you, if this whole room were Poland, He's going after that much. A little worthless spit of ground. Hamlet, the Polak won't defend it. It's already garrisoned. He's already, the Polish king, surrounded it with troops. Hamlet, line 25. 2,000 souls and 20,000 ducats will not debate the question of this straw. The straw, this trifling, insignificant, meaningless matter. We don't know what the matter is. It's not just the land. The land is a symptom of what the real matter or problem is. Okay? In fact, Hamlet says, this is the imposthume of much wealth and peace. Imposthume like a um, a blister. Uh, a wound that is corrupted and has got a lot of pus and stuff in it. This is the imposthume of much wealth and peace that inward breaks, that is, the wound breaks inside or the blister breaks inside and does what? How can an appendicitis kill you? If your appendix gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then ruptures, the reason it's getting bigger is because it is full of pus and other dangerous material. When it ruptures, that spreads and you can die very quickly. Okay? My son was nearly died. He had one, his appendix ruptured and we caught it on about the second or third day. But because he was all muscle, there wasn't any place for the infection to go. So, Hamlet says, and it shows no cause without why the man dies. That is, He's saying, there had to be something that caused that man to die, and it was all inside. Okay? Captain leaves. Rosalind Grant says, come on, Hamlet, we've got to go. He, give me a minute. 
Gehama gives us a soliloquy. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. For Hamlet, this is another occasion. Just like when he met with those players. And the player does the scene with Priam and Hecuba. And stuff. He's like, you know, that should spur me on to my revenge. Why does this? Because he says, here, what young Fortune Bob is going to do is he's going to sacrifice, he changes the numbers, 20,000 men. Well, between Fort Brown and Poland, 20,000 men are going to die for this little scrap of land that is worth nothing. In fact, it's not even big enough to bury them in. Why? For honor. For honor. He says, rightly to be great. 53. Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument. Not to stir, not to act. Did he have great argument when he killed Polonius? Not really, but put yourself in his shoes. You're in your mother's room and you're having a conversation that is pretty serious. And you find out you're being spied on. See, that is great argument. That's a great reason to do something. Okay? But greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honor's at stake. That is, if someone has impugned your honor, your name, your integrity, he's saying, you've got to be willing to do great things. Great there meaning kind of catastrophic. So he says, let's see. Let me take... Take my measurement. Uh, father killed, mother stained. Notice, however, she is willfully involved in the staining, or was. Excitements of my reason and blood, that is, these two things have excited my reason and my blood. And let all sleep, that is, and I don't act. Meanwhile, this guy, I see to my shame the imminent death of 20,000 men that for a fantasy and trick of fame go to their graves like beds. Fantasy and trick of fame? He's saying these men are dying because of the fame they will receive. Why? Because they won a great victory? No, they were honorable to their lord, to their captain. They did their duty. <clears throat> it's like in the um, poem by, <clears throat> I think it's Tennyson, Charge of the Life Brigade. Ours is not to reason why, ours is but to do and die. We go off into battle. <clears throat> so, he says, from this time forth, oh, my thoughts be bloody. But it's not going to be. He's going to pause again. Okay? Scene five. The queen comes in with Horatio and a gentleman. And a gentleman tells them something's wrong with Ophelia. She's talking about her father. Says she hears there's tricks in the world, etc., etc. Horatio, you better speak to her queen. She may strew, line 15, dangerous conjectures in ill-breeding minds. That is, you better talk to her because she might be out around the people and might give them reasons to believe false ideas. She might spread what today we call misinformation. So bring her in. And she says as an aside, the queen does, to my sick soul as sin's true nature is. Sin's True nature is what? A sickness in the soul. Okay. Each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. Toy, trifle, is what it means. Still doesn't explain it. She means each new, seemingly unrelated problem or situation indicates what? They're all building. 
they're building to this big problem. Here's a historical example. Imagine none of these posters are here, but there's dots just all over. And you're standing here like this, looking at these dots here, 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 here. And they don't make any sense. But you back away, and suddenly, you see a pattern, 9-11. Prior to 9-11, our intelligence community, the various alphabet agencies, each saw a bunch of dots. What none of them did was able to step back and see all of the dots. And if they had, because what happened after 9-11 in commission, they said, look, we had all the information. We knew something big was going to happen. They didn't know where, they didn't know how, but there were indications, like people enrolling in flight schools who were never learning how to land the planes. They only learned how to take off, okay? And other issues. She's saying, there's all these dots. This has gotta be building to some big problem. Second scene with Hamlet, Horatio, Marcellus, Bernardo. Well, even before then, with the four without Hamlet. They talk about how prior to Julius Caesar's death, what happened? There were these strange appearances, strange occurrences, and they all were indicating something big was about to happen. Okay? So, Ophelia comes in. Where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? Who's she talking about? She's talking about her father. How now, Ophelia? That is, how are you, Ophelia? And Ophelia starts to sing. Okay? She doesn't reply to any of the questions given to her. The king comes in. How do you do, pretty lady? Line 42. She says, well, God illed you. Illed means shield. They say the owl was a baker's daughter. And you got a footnote explaining there's a folk tale, monkish legend that a baker's daughter was turned into an owl for refusing bread to the savior. Okay? They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Lord, we know what we are, but not but know not what we may be. Just as the baker's daughter got turned into an owl for refusing bread for the Lord. She says, we know what we are now, but we don't know what we might become. Now, as with Hamlet, there's method in that madness. That, by the way, is a paraphrase of St. Paul. I think it's the Second Corinthians. Okay? The king says, it's a conceit upon her father. That is, this is an idea, a imagination, a fantasy about her father. Why? Because we know what he was. He was the advisor and he was living. And now, now what? What does every, but, well, what do most people think when someone close to them dies? What now? Where, where is that person now? You know, if one is religious, depending upon one's religious tradition, they might be with God, they might be with Allah, they might become part of the great Brahma, etc. Or they might just become nothing and it's like that. So she goes on and sings. And the king, middle of the page, line 66, asks, how long has she been like this? And Ophelia has a little speech. She's not replying to the question. She's just kind of blurting this out. I hope all will be well. I hope all will be well. Meaning, I hope everything works out. Shakespeare's play, all's well that ends well. Everything that ends well is well. <laughs> all right? So, I hope all will be well. We must be patient. Why? And what does patient mean? A 
doesn't just mean wait. We have to wait how? Hopefully. Why? Because it's only with hope that things end well, that all will be well. Romans 8.28, St. Paul says, All things work together for good for those who love God. That's the hoping that all will be well. But I cannot choose but weep to think they would lay him in the cold ground. She hopes all will be well, but here, now, what is her reality? Her father's been buried. That's the reality. Why? What, what can Laertes do? Bring him back from the dead? No. What kind of play is it? It's a revenge tragedy. Is she saying, ooh, Laertes has got to get revenge? Possibly. Okay. So she leaves. Horatio goes after her. King tells him to. And he says, this is because of her father's death. Gertrude, Gertrude, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. Well, that's essentially what Gertrude said when she said, each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. He's saying the problems just keep mounting. Well, so far, only one person has died. Well, two if you count King Hamlet. There's going to be a lot more deaths. And he lists those battalions. Her father slain, your son gone. By his own hand, that is, he had to be removed because of his own actions. The people muddied, thick and unwholesome in their thoughts and whispers for good Polonius' death. How are they thick and muddied in their thoughts and whispers regarding Polonius' death? He's saying... Rumors have been spread. Conspiracy theories. Well, if you're the head of a government and you don't want rumors to spread and you want conspiracy, conspiracies to spread, how can you stop those from happening? I'm not picking on any particular politician. It applies to all presidents. You tell the truth. All presidents lie. They don't tell the truth. They massage the truth. They put out a version that's not fully true. What, you know, what often brings down powerful people, whether you're talking about a political leader, a business leader, a religious leader, is it some crime? It's what comes after that. It's the attempt to cover up that crime. It's the attempt to deflect blame from that crime or moral fault, etc. Okay? So, in the king's little speech, he says, Laertes is back. Poor Ophelia, divided from herself and her fair judgment, without the which we are pictures or mere beasts. And then he goes on and talks about Laertes being back. So what does that mean? Divided from herself and her fair judgment, without which we are pictures or mere beasts. He's saying the thing that makes us human, that differentiates us from all the rest of the animal world, is the ability to reason, to practice judgment. Notice, she is divided from herself and her fair judgment. It's an idea Shakespeare has already alluded to. When Gertrude said, Hamlet can't be blamed for what he did because he's not himself, he's mad, Hamlet is then going to follow up on that in Act 5, when he's going to lay claim to an insanity defense for the murder of Polonius. So, her brother is in secret come from France, feeds on his wonder, keeps himself in clouds, wants not buzzers to infect his ear with pestilent speeches of his father's death. Meaning... He doesn't want to know the truth. See, he's one of those whose mind has already been muddied. How do we know? 
because Laertes is going to come in in just a moment. And he's essentially going to accuse the king of his father's death. Essentially, he doesn't literally do that. Okay? Messenger comes in and says, Laertes is leading a riotous head, line 95. That is, Laertes is at the head of an insurrection. And the rabble, the people, are crying, choose we, Laertes shall be king. That's why I said it's an insurrection. They want to overthrow Claudius and put Laertes in his stead, in his place. They break into the castle. The king says the doors are broke. Laertes and others come in. Laertes tells the others to shoo back out, let him speak with the king. Okay. And he says, 110, 111, 112. I thank you. Keep the door. O oh, thou vile king, give me my father. Now, that can mean two things. Give me his body so I may properly bury it. Or, if you've ever seen Princess Bride, one of the greatest films ever made, there's a scene where the character in Montoya finally kills the guy who killed his father, Count Ruger. And just before he does, he gets Count Ruger to beg for his life. He says, what will you do? He says, I'll give you anything. I'll give you everything you want. What do you want? And he says, I want my father back, and stabs him. That might be what Laertes wants. It's an impossibility, right? The queen calmly said, Laertes, in other words, down boy, Laertes, that drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard. If I have a drop of blood in me that is calm, then that means I am a bastard child. I am not the son of Polonius. Okay? King says, Laertes, what is the cause that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? So large. Let him go, Gertrude. Gertrude's kind of, no, no, don't worry. He can't hurt him. He can't harm me. He says, do not fear our person. Line 119. There's such divinity doth hedge a king that treason can but peep toward it would. Acts a little of his will. Why is that a problem for the king to be saying that? He just said, there's a divinity. God protects kings. Why? Romans 12. God has instituted government among men. And men must obey those governments. All right? Paul says. Why is it a problem that the king says this? How did he become king? He yes, but how did he die? He didn't just die of natural causes. Claudius killed him. God didn't make a hedge around Hamlet Sr. and stop Claudius from killing him. So he says, don't worry, Gertrude, he can't harm me. Laertes, why art thou thus and sit? What's wrong? Let him go, Gertrude. Where's my father? Dead. But not by him, Gertrude says. He, he didn't do it. Let him demand his fill. What's he really telling his wife? Would you shut up? How came he dead? <laughs> I'll not be juggled with it, is don't try to trick me. I'll be revenged most truly for my father. Line 133 and 4. Who's going to stop you? Only my will, Laertes says. So, King, 137. Good Laertes, if you desire to know the certainty of your father, is it written your revenge at swoop stake? That is kind of like hurly-burly. You will draw both friend and foe, winner and loser. Is it written in your revenge, is it demanded of in your revenge, that multiple others will die so that you can get the one person who killed your father? 
That's what he said. No, none but his enemies. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Do you want to know who they are? To his good friends, thus wide, I'll open my arms, meaning I will embrace my father's friends. Now you speak like a good child. I'm guiltless of your father's death, and I've got a lot of grief for it. Then suddenly we hear Ophelia. And she comes in. And Laertes looks at her and says, Oh, heat, dry up my brain, tears, seven times salt, burn out the sense of virtue my, of mine eye. Why? Because when she comes in, she looks absolutely different than she did before. Her hair should be all disheveled. Her clothing should not be all nice and pretty. Just looks totally crazy. Got a lot of it that goes on there. She goes back out. And Laertes, do you see this, O God? King, I must commune with your grief. I share with your grief. Or you deny me what is right. He says, go apart for a minute or for a while. Talk to your wisest friends. They shall hear and judge between you and me. Be you content to lead your patience, lend your patience to us. That is, give me some time and we shall jointly labor with your soul to give it due content. If you give me some time, I will work with you to bring satisfaction to your soul. Meaning, I'll help you get your revenge. Okay. Laertes says, let this be so. His means of death, that is how came Polonius dead, his obscure funeral, obscure means hidden, it wasn't public. No trophy sword nor hatchment o'er his bones, no noble right nor formal ostentation cry to be heard as twere from heaven to earth that I must call it in question. He's talking about how Polonius was buried. Why was he buried, it implies, secretly in the dark of night so that nobody saw it? Why wasn't there a public church ceremony? Did Claudius not want him to have his last rites? See, that's unclear. I think it's more of what did Claudius want to have happen to Polonius' body. He wanted it in the ground and out of the public eye as quickly as possible. Why? He thought to stop people from talking. What, did he, what happened as a result? It started people talking. King. You'll get satisfaction. I'll give answer to this all. Where the offense is, where the offense is, let the great axe fall. That is the axe of revenge. He's saying, the offense isn't with me. It's Hamlet. Okay? Well, he hasn't said that yet. Horatio comes in, scene six. And Horatio is given a letter by a sailor. The letter's from Hamlet. Hamlet explains to Horatio what's happened and why he's alive, okay? He says, make sure the king gets these letters that I have sent, okay? And repair thou to me, that is, come to me, come help me as soon as you can. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern hold their course for England, for of them I have much to tell thee. So, when they were at ship, two days at ship, they were attacked by pirates. Hamlet was captured by the pirates. Rosencrantz and Gittelstern on their ship still made way to England. And the implication is they were already so close to England, they stopped there, right? Scene seven. King comes in with Laertes. Now must your conscience my acquittance seal. What does it mean to be acquitted of a crime? You're found not guilty. So he says, 
your conscience must now acquit me. All right? And you must put me in your heart for a friend. I'm, I'm here to help you, Laertes. All right? Since you have heard, and with a knowing ear, that he which hath your noble father slain, he pursued my life. Hamlet wanted to kill me. I think that probably indicates that between the killing of Polonius and now, Gertrude told her husband what? That Hamlet said, is it the king? Okay. Laertes, that, that appears to be the case. But why didn't you act? Why you proceeded not against these feats, so criminal, so capital nature? Why did you do anything? The king has two reasons. All right? One, the queen, his mother, lives almost by his looks. That is, oh, she would take it badly if I did something to Hamlet. She's okay with sending him to England. Why? Because she thinks change of play, change of pace, change of venue, good salt, fresh air will bring Hamlet back to his senses. He says, and for me, why I didn't do it, he says, the other motive, why to a public count I might go, might not go, is the great love the general gender bear him. General gender refers to the people of the kingdom. I couldn't lock up Hamlet, why? Because the people love him. And it's not just some of the people. It's not like, you know, our country, you, you read stuff and everything says, you know, we're, we're totally divided, you know. Pro-Trump, anti-Trump kind of camps, so to speak. He's, it's not like that. He's saying, everybody loves Hamlet. If I were to act against Hamlet, he says, who dipping all his faults in their affection would like the spring that turneth wood to stone, convert his jives to graces, so that my arrows too slightly timbered for so loud a wind would have reverted to my bow. In other words, my actions against Hamlet would have rebounded against me. Well, what did Hamlet say to his mother at the end of Act 3 when he said, you know I've got to go to England and I will trust my two school friends as I will Adder's Fang? He says, it is the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard. That is what Claudius is saying. If I had acted against Hamlet, I would have been the one to suffer, not Hamlet. Okay? Laertes. So Laertes hears this and he thinks, okay, so we didn't act against Hamlet because it would anger Hamlet's mother and because the king loves her so much, he'd have lost. He didn't act against Hamlet because the people loved Hamlet so much and he'd have been the one who paid, not Hamlet. Damned either way. So Laertes says, so I have a noble father lost and a sister driven into desperate terms. Um whose worth, if praises may go back again, stood challenger on Mount of all the age for her perfections, but my revenge will come. And what he says there about his sister is, she was the pinnacle of beauty, grace, charm, all that kind of stuff. And she's crazy, and my father's dead. I will have my revenge. King, no, 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 no. don't worry about that. Don't lose any sleep over that. Break not your sleeps. He says, you must not think that we are made of stuff so flat and dull that we can let our beard be shook with danger and think it past time. What kind of friend do you think I am? He says. He says, no, no, no. I loved your father, and we love ourselves. <laughs> meaning, I loved your father, I didn't intend for him to die, and I love myself, meaning, and I don't intend to die either. So he says, and he gets interrupted with a messenger. And the messenger comes in and says, my king, here are letters from Hamlet. What should immediately go through the king's mind? 
Hamlet's on his way to England. How did he send letters? And he reads, high and mighty, you shall know I am set naked on your kingdom. Tomorrow shall I beg leave to see your kingly eyes. Set naked on your kingdom means I don't have a royal retinue. He's a prince. He should have attendants. He said, just little old me all by myself. There's a possible another meaning of the phrase naked. Meaning, just me and my own physical strength. Like mano a mano. We're going to, you and I, <laughs> we're going to have a meeting, king. Laertes says, is that Hamlet's right? He said, yep, it is. King asks Laertes, in a postscript here, he says, alone, can you devise me? Meaning, can you advise me what he means? I don't know what he means. Let him come. So that I shall live and tell him to his teeth, thus didst thou. And I think he's got in mind here, he will like welcome Hamlet. And as he grabs Hamlet by the shoulder, he's going to kill him the same way he killed Hamlet killed his father. We're going to find out later in the play, as they both lay dying, okay, or just before then, Hamlet and Laertes were friends. They weren't best friends like Hamlet and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, but they were friends. So, the king says, um, if he be now returned, line 59, as checking at his voyage, and that he means no more to undertake it, I will work him to an exploit. Now ripen my device. That is, I've got an idea. Here's what we're going to do. Under the witch he shall not choose but fall, and for his death no wind of blame shall breathe. Even his mother shall uncharge the practice and call it accident. I've come up with a way for Hamlet to die, and no one will be blamed for his death. Okay, so you have been talked of, the king says to Laertes, uh, since you travel much, and that in Hamlet's hearing, for a quality wherein they say you shine. Your sum of parts did not together pluck such envy from him as did that one. And that my regard of the unworthy of siege. In other words, while you've been at university, word has spread throughout Denmark of all your qualities, but one more than everything else. What, what, what's that? Laertes asks. Da, 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 da. I'm trying to find the exact spot. This Norman hath made such confession of you, this is line 93, line 96, and for your rapier most especial. Okay? Rapier. He's talking about fencing, not sword fighting. Sword fighting is two-handed, where you try to beat someone to death with the sword. The broadsword in the medieval days, which is kind of when Hamlet is saying, Broadsword is a very long, very heavy sword. Could not be really properly raised with one hand, especially if you have mail on this arm. So it's two-handed, the blade is dull, you beat someone to death with it, like a bludgeon, right? A rapier is actually a, I should bring one in, is actually a square blade. It's like a long tube that is squared, and at the end can be sharpened to a point. If you watch like Olympic fencing, Okay? Those have tips on the end. And the idea is to hit someone with the tip. If you hit them with the side, you don't get any points. It's got to be with the tip. And you know it's a tip because the rapier will bend. Right? Because it's very, very thin and flexible. He says, you are known for your fencing. So, was your father dear to you? Or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? He goes, no, of course. So what does he say? We're going to set up a fencing match between you and Hamlet. Notice what 
Claudius said. He said, people praised you up one side and down the other, but one thing that was said about you really stirred Hamlet's envy and jealousy when they praised Laertes' rapier, his fencing ability. Why? Because Hamlet fancies himself an excellent fencer. <clears throat> so, Claudius, that speech that begins on the top of 1316, Act 4, Scene 7, finishes and says, 121, but to the quick of the ulcer, that is to the point, Hamlet comes back. Hamlet's now back. What would you undertake to show yourself your father's son in deed more than in words? What does he mean in deed? The revenge. To cut him in throat in the church. I would cut his throat in a church. Now that's a sacrilegious act. According to the church, you shed blood in a church, you're damned. You shouldn't do that in a church, Claudius says. Revenge should have no bounds, you know. But keep close within your chamber. That is, stay in your room. Hamlet shall know that you're come home. We'll talk about your praise of excellence and such. And we'll set up this fencing match. How does he know Hamlet will agree to it? Because you've already been praised so highly and Hamlet is jealous of that praise. So, he says, he, being remiss, most generous and free from all contriving, will not peruse the foils, so that with ease or with a little shuffling you may choose a sword unbated and in a passive practice requite him for your father. Unbated means without a, like a plug put on the tip. So, he says, you guys, in a scuffle, you can grab a rapier without a blunt object on the tip and run him through. So, what is one way Hamlet will die? Claudius suggests. He'll be run through with the rapier. Laertes, I'll do it. Good idea. And to that purpose, he says, I'll anoint my sword. I have a poison, an unction, from a mountebank that is a false pharmacist, someone who sells poisons. He says, and I'll anoint the tip, whose poison is so strong that if you're scratched with it, you'll be dead within the hour. I'll touch my point with this contagion that if I gall him slightly, that is, even if it's just a scratch, the poison will kill him. King. Okay. So now that's two ways, right? One being run through, two being poisoned. King says, if either of these fail, I'll mix a drink. Okay? That when you guys are hot, I'll pause the battle. And I'll give Hamlet this drink, and the drink will have a poison in it. So he'll either die by stabbing, die by poison on the rapier, or die by drinking the poison. Queen comes in and says, your sister's dead, Laertes. Your sister's drowned. Where? And she tells us, there's a brook, and a willow grows askant, that is, at an angle over the brook. There, with his fantastic garlands, that is, willow trees have long, stringy branches that you can use like to weave baskets and such. With fantastic garlands did she make of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold men, our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. So, there, on the pendant boughs, that is, the boughs hanging over this brook, Uh, her crowned weeds clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke. So she has made in a circlet, like a crown, this weed, this, this 
like crown of flowers, and she was trying to hang it on a branch. She goes out, she reaches, and the branch she is on breaks. When down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook, her clothes spread wide. There's a very, very famous painting from the 19th century. Um, and it's like Ophelia drowned, and it's Ophelia like this, and her gown is all spread out around her in the water. And she's just like this on her back, looking up at the sky. Which time, that is, while she's lying there, she just floats. She chanted snatches of old lauds, that is hymns, as one incapable, meaning unknowing, of her distress. She didn't realize that as she was lying there floating, her gown was doing what? Sucking up all the water, getting heavy. But long it could not be till that her garments heavy with their drink pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Then she is drowned, drowned, drowned. Laertes, too much of water hast thou poor Ophelia. That is, she has too much water now because she's dead. She also had too much water because of her tears over her father's death. Question. How did Ophelia die? Okay. Surface level answer is she drowned. It's going to show up on a quiz. She drowned, okay? Does she commit suicide? The beginning of the next act is where that idea gets suggested. That her death is not accidental because we are going to hear the clowns debate. Did she die of an accidental death or did she commit, her, uh, did she commit suicide? Um, I know it's a little bit early, but we're going to stop there. We'll pick up with Act 5 on Thursday. Act 5 is not as long as the other acts. I think we'll, we'll probably get through it. Um, and I will put up a quiz over Act 5 probably on Thursday. Okay. I've graded your quizzes that were due Sunday. Everybody... Nearly everybody did pretty well on those. All right. Have a good day. Uh, stay safe.